This month, The Spectator becomes the first magazine in history to print 10,000 issues, and we'd like to celebrate with you. Subscribe to The Spectator for 12 weeks for just £12. Plus, we'll send you a bottle of commemorative Spectator gin, absolutely free. Go to spectator.co.uk forward slash celebrate. Hello and welcome to The Spectator's Audio Reads. This week is the Easter special. First, we have Toby Young. Britain needs you, Boris. Toby Young. As I write, Boris Johnson is in intensive care at St Thomas's Hospital, battling with coronavirus. For someone with such an unwavering belief in his own destiny, this must be profoundly difficult. He's a man who's beaten the odds over and over to become Mayor of London in a Labour city, to lead the Leave campaign to victory in the teeth of overwhelming opposition, to become Prime Minister in spite of all his personal baggage and then to win the largest Conservative majority since 1987. Here is a man who cannot stare into the jaws of defeat without grabbing hold of victory with both hands. Yet the odds of him triumphing, in this case, keep narrowing. Of those who've caught the virus aged 50 to 59, Boris is 55, their chances of requiring hospitalisation are only 1 in 10, and just 12% of that fraction end up in intensive care. A hundred to one against, and he's still drawn the short straw. Once a COVID-19 patient has been admitted to intensive care, their chances of coming out are close to 50-50. It's his sense of public duty that has landed him in this hole. People who don't know him, and even some who do, talk disapprovingly of his arrogance and vaulting ambition. But the man I've known for more than 35 years contains multitudes of which Richard III is only one. Henry V is also in there, one of his better angels. He cannot resist the pull of obligation to his country, the need to be of service. I remember cornering him at a spectator party shortly after he'd announced his intention to become an MP, and asking him why he was bothering with politics when he was so clearly destined for the top in journalism. Surely, being the editor of The Telegraph would be much more fun than shinning up the greasy pole in Westminster. A career in journalism suited his mischievous Rabelaisian personality, whereas he'd have to rein all that in if he wanted to succeed in politics. He looked embarrassed, he hates being asked personal questions, and muttered something about public service. It took me a while to realise he was being serious. That must be the reason he refused to take it easy after being diagnosed with coronavirus. In spite of having a fever, he carried on chairing the daily COVID-915 AM meeting and continued going through his red boxes. Some people have criticised him for not handing over to Dominic Raab earlier, as if remaining at the helm was irresponsible. But it would have gone against everything in Boris's nature to hand over the wheel when navigating such a difficult passage, not while he still had any strength left. It's not a case of refusing to acknowledge his own vulnerability because of some misplaced sense of exceptionalism, but of carrying on regardless, out of sheer bloody-minded duty. Willpower and resilience will have just kicked in automatically. I don't suppose he gave it a second thought. I've often wondered what it must be like for him to be Prime Minister during his country's darkest hour since the Second World War. As I got to know him, it became clear that he saw himself as having a historic role to play in our island story. In politics, that doesn't make him particularly unusual. You'd be amazed how many obscure backbench MPs entertain fantasies of becoming Prime Minister. Much rarer is Boris's ability to inspire others with this belief. Even those who disliked him, he thought he was overrated, could never completely write him off. And those of us who've been closely following his career watching him fulfil his destiny, came to believe it was all wrapped up with Brexit, that winning the EU referendum, then the leadership, then the election, had all led inexorably to the role he was born for. This was the pivotal moment in Britain's history where he would bend events to his will and shape our future for decades to come. And yet, we were wrong, or at least not entirely right. That may still be his most important contribution, but in the meantime, Providence has something else in mind, something even more challenging. 
I'm not a man of faith, but at moments like this, you realise you're still animated by certain core, irrational beliefs. One of those is a kind of mystical belief in Britain's greatness and her ability to occasionally bring forth remarkable individuals, ordinary men and women of extraordinary ability, to paraphrase Badgett, who can serve her at critical junctures. I've always thought of Boris as one of those people, not just suspected it, but known it in my bones. And in spite of his shrinking odds of survival, I still cannot bring myself to doubt. Britain isn't finished with you yet, Boris. You will come back to us, full of strength and vigour, larger than life like never before. You must. That was Toby Young. And now, Douglas Murray on what he finds heartening about the coronavirus crisis. Our flawed species still stands a chance, by Douglas Murray. There was always one key flaw in our species, which is that someone always shags a monkey. I have expressed this thought fairly regularly in private, often to friends who don't get the reference about the likely origin of AIDS and look at me strangely ever after. Still, I find it a useful rule. We humans are, perhaps always have been, as weak as our weakest member makes us. And if just one of us chooses of an evening to force themselves on one of our simian cousins, then before long people across the planet start dropping dead. I suppose the monkey shagger rule will now have to be updated to take into account the fact that someone will always blend a bat. For however developed or progressive we fancy ourselves, however many megacities we manage to build, we will still never have 100% certainty that there isn't someone looking at some scrawny cave hanger and thinking, what a nice soup he would make. To contemplate these odds is to be filled with awe. It seems miraculous enough that our species can survive the stupidity of any one human being. The idea that in order to go on we need to survive the stupidity, gluttony and, I might mention, lustfulness of every human on planet Earth ought to put our chances at somewhere near naught. Yet here we still are for one reason alone, which is that our species also possesses a set of virtues which, with an uncanny precision, sometimes more than adequately makes up for the rest. These virtues may be dwelt upon less often, perhaps because we are embarrassed by them, perhaps because we take them for granted, or prefer our performative negation of them. But look at the virtues this country has demonstrated in the past several weeks, and you begin to think we might still have a chance against the bat-shaggers. Throughout recent years, we have read, and some of us have written, constantly about the breakdown of trust in our society. One by one, the institutions that held the public's trust were said to have fallen whether it was the judiciary, police, parliament, monarchy, or anything else. Cast your mind back only a few months, and we in Britain were said to be living in a divided country, even sometimes a failed state, caught in a crevice between a set of competing sources of power, none of which could command the public's trust. The British people, even more than others, were said to have become distrustful of all authority, including all varieties of expert. Yet here we are, at Easter 2020, all cocooned more or less agreeably in our homes, faithfully obeying orders, not because we must, like the population of some communist despotism, but because, like citizens in democracies worldwide, we have agreed to do so. If, as a result, as seems possible at the time of writing, the angel of death clips its wings on our abode, but leaves the structure standing, then there will be plenty of gratitude for us to feel. Among those sources of gratitude should be the fact that during this time we have been reminded, beneath the din of what we actually rely on, listen to, and need. We listened, 
as the Prime Minister told us to remain in our homes. We responded when he asked us to volunteer. We were concerned when we were told that our National Health Service risked being overwhelmed. We were persuaded when the nation's top scientists showed us their graphs, became household names and persuaded us to alter our lives. Some people cavilled, of course. They worried that we might have become over-subservient. But that didn't seem a fair critique, certainly not in this phase. The British public did not do what we were told because we are by nature a pliant, subservient people. We did what we were told because we believed and trusted that a situation could have occurred which would have left our hospitals overwhelmed and taken our country into disaster. We acted to avert the worst of that situation, and if we have managed to do so and end up forgetting that fact, then we'll be the lucky ones. Whatever happens, there is going to be mending to do. But what strikes me now is how, in a nation alleged to have been so low on trust and respect, we have been quietly storing it away, even while we pretended otherwise. When a real problem came, there wasn't much time for the people with imaginary ones. At no stage was there a demand for grievance studies professors to address the nation. As the virus spread, absolutely nobody called for a press conference of social scientists. We wanted to hear from politicians clearly trying to do their best. We wanted to hear from medical experts. And finally, we wanted to hear from the Queen, who remains the person best placed in our national life, or any nation's life, to put in context what will hopefully soon recede in the national memory into one of those ugly things that just sometimes happens, like the smog or Scots nationalism. I don't know what we'll end up taking away from all this. Perhaps a lot of things. A bad financial hit, certainly. And there'll be other things too. Perhaps there will be a knock to our idea about the inevitability of human progress. But who knows? It's ugly to use the catastrophe as a metastasizing force for whatever your own political viewpoint happens to be. And, of course, it is possible that as a society we take nothing away from this, that it'll just be one of those strange things like the riots in 2011, which seemed for a moment to have changed everything, but end up changing nothing. For my own part... I already know one thing I'll take, which is admiration, not just for the people in this country, but for people around the world who volunteered themselves, sequestered themselves, and in some cases sacrificed themselves. Not because they had no choice, but because in a moment of terrible clarity, we were all reminded of that simple truth Rilke wrote. Because to be here means so much. That was Douglas Murray. And last, here's Melissa Kite. Real Life by Melissa Kite. Here, do you want some of the private stuff from out the back? Said the butcher to the builder boyfriend, leaning forward over the counter and winking theatrically. The Builder Bee winced a little, for this was starting to feel like the terrifying scene in League of Gentlemen, when Mr Briss starts selling a mysterious and highly addictive special meat to the residents of Royston Vasey. Thankfully, this butcher was only selling private lamb. He revealed his secret stash to the BB because he took a liking to him. The butcher grinned, revealing big teeth between rosy cheeks, before disappearing out the back and returning with an entire side, which he butchered in front of him offering him as much as he wanted. When he got home with the meaty chops, the BB said he had never seen anything so funny and frightening. The butcher declared he had nothing but contempt for the spoilt shoppers, who'd been rude to him for decades, and now came in every day complaining about the difficulties of fulfilling their posh recipes. Consequently, he filled his display cabinet with sausages, bacon and the odd chicken, and kept everything else out the back. 
He was, apparently, only selling the private stuff to people he considered working class. The builder bee had just come off a roof, which his work he continues to do legitimately because mending holes in buildings is essential so far as anyone can make out. Dressed in his tar spattered jeans, steel toe cap boots and woolly hat, he must have looked precisely the sort of worker this butcher considered deserving. And so he is, I suppose. Consequently, he took him into his confidence. After serving him the private stuff, the butcher stiffened as a well-dressed lady entered the shop, perused the display disdainfully and said, Do you not have any lamb? in an imperious tone. No, love, just what's out, bacon or sausage. And he winked at the builder bee again in a most alarming fashion. I fried the shops plain and served them with a good, honest mash and thick gravy. It would have been a betrayal of the butcher's principles to subject them to any form of fancification. Any question they might be decorated with a jus or sat on a bed of something middle class like creamed spinach, even if I had the means to do such a thing, which I didn't really, was taking the proverbial. And we want to keep our Mr Briss happy. The queue at the farm shop is now right across the pebble drive towards the field that's the overflow car park. In another week, the queue might be all the way around that field, over the fence, across the road and into the field where they seized the 123 horses last year. It seems an age since that happened. A lot of the folks who rang that messy old place into the authorities may soon be wishing they hadn't had those big fat cobs removed because they were standing in mud. The trial of the farmer who owns the herd of horses was postponed a few weeks ago as several lawyers in the courtroom fell sick. Where the horses are and how long they can be kept going in the current climate is anyone's guess. The farm is now covered in a hundred acres of grass they might have been grazing and a barn stacked to the rafters with hay. But the irony of that seems lost on most local people. Not the man who runs the garden centre, who is helping put deliveries together, running backwards and forwards, ranting about greed. Much like the butcher, he had come to his own moral conclusions and was prioritising old people. I mentioned the horse seizure, seeming like another era, and he agreed. There are fine, upstanding individuals in this society of ours who would eat your cat as soon as look at it. I see where he's coming from, but I'm not so sure. I fear the opposite, that people have been pampered so long they are not prepared to tap into their instincts to survive. The BB, however, points out that there is an awful lot of vegan food left on the shelves in stores that are otherwise empty. Could it be that when push comes to shove, the adults practising food faddishness will revert to eating what nature truly intended? Perhaps it was only when there was an endless supply of everything that the veganuary crowd were happy to opt for an allegedly cruelty-free, environmentally sustainable food source in the name of doing something a bit different. Maybe now general survival is coming into question. They will be grateful for any meat and cheese they can get as the free-from ranges moulder on the shelves. That was Melissa Kite. Thanks for listening and join us again next week.